Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop blaming. Start looking for open doors. Start looking for opportunities. Start being creative. It doesn't matter what you were. Stop talking about what I was and start talking about what I am. I found at least 10, and I'm sure that there are more, but I found at least 10 wrong mindsets, wrong ways that the Israelites were thinking that I believe kept them wandering around the wilderness. It wasn't their enemies. We often think, well, if the devil, and if, and if, and but, and but, and if, and if. But really, so many times, we are our own problem. It's not our problem that's our problem. It's our attitude toward our problem that is our problem. It's our mindset toward our problem that is our problem. Even when we have a problem, we think, well, this is just too much for me. I just can't do this anymore. Well, that's a wrong mindset that can keep you in bondage. But if you can think, I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who strengthens me, and I am not going to give up, then you've already won. It's just simple, simply a matter of walking it out. The next wrong attitude that the Israelites had that got them in a lot of trouble and will also get us in a lot of trouble and keep us from living in the promised land is it's not my fault. <laughs> not my fault. It's not my fault that I don't, you know, I don't feel good. It's not my fault. It's not my fault I'm in debt. It's not my fault my marriage is falling apart. It's your fault. It's not my fault I've got such a big mess in my life. Tell you what, only the truth will make you free. And it's not the truth about somebody else that will set me free. It's the truth about me that will set me free. Now, we're going to have a little more meat here right now, so get ready. Okay. How freeing would it be if you could say, you know, I don't feel good because I don't take care of my body. I don't sleep like I should. I don't eat like I should. I don't rest like I should. I ought to feel bad. <laughs> I'm in debt because I spend too much money. <laughs> Anybody who spends more than they make will be in debt. <laughs> I don't behave wisely. I'm led by my emotions. My marriage is in trouble because I'm selfish and I'm hard to get along with and I have a big mouth. <laughs> Come on now, I'm leaving here in about 30 minutes. And <laughs> so I got to bear down here and we got to have this baby, okay? Now we're going into hard labor. <laughs> Without an epidural, by the way. I have a mess in my life because I've not obeyed God. You say, oh no, that's, that, that, is not, that is not correct, Sister Joyce. I have problems because I was abused. I have problems because I was abandoned. I have problems because I didn't get the same opportunity as other people. All my friends got to go to college. I didn't get to go to college. I have problems because, 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 because. Well, you know what? Yeah, there are things that we have to deal with because of the things that have happened to us. And they may be a reason why you are the way you are, but you can't let them become an excuse to stay that way. The moment that a reason becomes an excuse, then we're trapped in it. And the devil is very happy about the whole thing. We know, we know how this got started. Shall we go to Genesis chapter 3? <laughs> Let us begin at the beginning. Blame started in the garden. Genesis 3, 12 and 13. And the man said to God, <laughs> the woman that you gave me, 
You don't even want me to get started on that whole woman thing. I do not have time for that. <laughs> the white, always the woman. Well, I, I do have to at least say this. It was not Eve's fault that Adam ate the apple. Well, she gave it to him, and she tempted him. Well, he was supposed to be the man of the garden. The man of the garden. And when she offered him that apple, he should have said, woman, what is your problem? You know what God has said to us. in his life. And then, of course, Eve blamed the devil. Well, it was the serpent. He came and beguiled me and cheated me and outwitted me. And all both of them had to do was just very simply and sweetly do what God told them to do. We don't do what God tells us to do, and then we always want to put the blame somewhere. We see the same situation with Abraham and Sarah. Let us go there for just a moment. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And Sarah got a bright idea about how to solve her problem. Oh, I know what we'll do. So she gave her handmaiden to Abram. Told me to go have intercourse with her. How many of you ladies know that wasn't very bright? <laughs> Any sane woman would know that that's a problem waiting to happen right there. <laughs> now, just to be fair, you know, this was something that occurred back in those days at different times, but that was not what God had told them to do. He said, I'm going to give you a child from your own body. But they didn't want to what? W-A-I-T. Wait <laughs> and be patient. So just a few verses here to get the point across. Verse 3, so Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her Egyptian maid, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his second wife. And he had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. And when she saw that she was with child, she looked with contempt upon her mistress and despised her. Now she's got a second wife with an attitude. <laughs> then Sarah said to Abram, here it comes. May the responsibility for my wrong and the deprivation of my rights be upon you. I gave my maid into your bosom, and when she saw that she was with child, I have now become contemptible and despised in her eyes. It's your fault, Abram. Blame. Got to blame somebody else. For years and years, I blamed all my bad behavior on the fact that I'd been abused. For years. I blamed, I blamed, I blamed. It was never my fault. It was always somebody else. It was always something else. I blamed my unhappiness on something else. And I spent a lot of years going around and around the same stupid mountain. It's not my fault. It's this, it's that. If I had more money, I'd be happy. If I had a bigger house, I'd be happy. If, 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 if my back didn't hurt, I'd be happy. I was never going to be happy no matter what I had because there was a problem in me. I had a problem, and I needed to stop blaming it on everybody else. And maybe, just maybe, this is helping somebody here in the room today or maybe somebody who's watching by TV. Any sin can be forgiven but not until you face truth. Truth and mercy meet together. Can't have mercy without truth. That's what repentance is. It's coming to a place of truth. 
You don't have to feel condemned. You don't have to feel guilty, but you do have to face it and give it to God. No matter how ugly it is, face it, call it what it is, give it to God, and learn how to fast track through the wilderness and enjoy the wonderful life that Jesus died to give you. I'm going to ask people today, please stop blaming everything in your life on somebody else. I'm not going to go on for a minute because that's got to settle. Please stop blaming your bad attitude on your circumstances. As believers, we are supposed to be able to have bad circumstances and keep a good attitude. We're supposed to be the stable group. Oh, yes, we love to think about Jesus. Jesus the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Well, guess where he lives? In you and in me. And he lives in us to equip us to go out in the world and behave the same way that he behaves in the same kind of situations that he was in. To be an example. We well, always got an excuse for everything. Nothing's our fault. The Bible says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. There's always grace available. There's always God's goodness available, free of charge, but not until we face truth. I dare not stay with that or I'll not get done for sure. Wrong thought pattern number seven. I feel sorry for myself because I've got so many problems. <laughs> Self-pity is the most useless emotion. You can be addicted to self-pity. And every time you don't get your way, the first response you have is to feel sorry for yourself. Self-pity, now you're not going to like this, but it's true, is idolatry. Why, Sister Joyce, I wouldn't worship an idol. When we're full of self-pity, we turn in on ourselves and idolize ourselves. And all we can think about is me, 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 me. That's all we think about. What you did to me. What I'm not, what you're not doing for me. What's happening to me. Please, 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 please. When something doesn't go your way and you can feel that. Go, no, 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 no. I cannot be pitiful and powerful. I am not going to sit here and waste this day feeling sorry for myself all day. God will take care of me. If I trust God, God will take care of me. Now, let me just finish this off by simply saying, not the whole thing I'm finishing off, but this point. Many of you are not getting a breakthrough simply because you will not give up self-pity. Yeah. Feeling sorry for ourselves does not move the hand of God. <laughs> Only faith moves God. And faith is a positive, hopeful expectation that something good is going to happen to me at any moment. Amen? Can't feel sorry for yourself. I love to read the story about Zacchaeus in Luke 19. I don't have time to go there, but I'll just tell it to you. Jesus was coming to town, and Zacchaeus, along with all the rest of the crowd, wanted to see him. But Zacchaeus was a little short guy. And he couldn't see over the people. Now, you know, we all fall short in some way. <laughs> so I think Zacchaeus, there's more to that story than just the fact that he wasn't as tall as everybody else. I think there's a message there for us. We all come up short in some way. Well, instead of feeling sorry for himself and sitting down, everybody else gets to see Jesus. I can't see Jesus because I'm short. Man, what a bummer it is to be short. 
I miss everything in life just because I'm short. <laughs> no, the Bible says that Zacchaeus ran on ahead of the rest of the crowd and climbed up in a tree so he could see Jesus. I think some of you need to climb a tree. You need to quit blaming where you fell short and what you don't have and just find some way around what you think is your misfortune or your so-called inability. Zacchaeus climbed a tree so when Jesus came, he could see him better than anybody else. But here's the amazing thing. The Bible says that as Jesus walked by, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus in the tree. Wonder why his attention was called to the tree. Something in Zacchaeus' determined spirit spoke to something in the spirit of Jesus. And when you have determination in your spirit rather than self-pity, you will attract the attention of Jesus. And you know what he said to Zacchaeus? Come on down here. I'm going to go to your house for dinner today. Whoa! Uh-oh. Yeah. Come on. But let's don't forget, he had to climb a tree. Well, climb a tree? I can't climb a tree. That's too hard. I can't climb a tree. What if I fall? <laughs> Maybe I should have the props team make me a tree so I could climb it in these meetings. Amen. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop blaming. Start looking for open doors. Start looking for opportunities. Start being creative. It doesn't matter what you were. Stop talking about what I was and start talking about what I am. You know, I was abused, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You might say, well, I was a prostitute. But you could say, I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. Old things pass away, and all things become brand new. Don't talk anymore about what you was. Start talking about who you are in Jesus. Woo-hoo. I just make myself so happy when I preach. Now. <laughs> Wrong thought pattern number eight. I've made too many mistakes to be blessed. Wow, is that a lie from the pit of hell? <laughs> Ephesians 1, we can get everything we need here right out of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses uh, 3 through 5. May blessing, praise, laudation, and eulogy be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual given by the Holy Spirit blessing in the heavenly realm. He doesn't bless us because we deserve it. He blesses us because we're in Christ. Even as in His love He chose us, picked us out for Himself as His own in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be wholly consecrated and set apart for Him and blameless in His sight. Verse 5, for he foreordained us, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted, revealed as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the purpose of his will. Why? Because it pleased him and was his kind intent. God doesn't bless anybody because they deserve it. Because none of us deserve it. He blesses us because he can't help himself. He's just a blesser. And when you start receiving that kind of free love and free grace from God, then all of a sudden you can begin to go out in the world and you can love people not because they deserve it, but just because you can't stand it if you don't bless somebody. Instead of having impatient fits, now I have blessing fits. I do. You don't want to get around me on a day when I'm having a blessing fit because you're going to get blessed. I'm going to buy you something. I'm going to give you something. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to edify you. I'm going to make you feel better before you get away from me than you did when you came. Because I just can't help it. I'm in a blessing fit. 
But I had to learn how to receive that from God. I tell God all the time, you got anything you want to do for anybody today? Here I am. I'm a little spiritual pig. I'll take it all. <laughs> all you got to know is know your position in Christ and ask. Ask. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever dare. To hope, ask, or think, we dare to have the boldness of approaching the, the throne of grace freely. You can be daring in your relationship with God. Not disrespectful, but bold. Not because you do everything right, but because you worship the one who has done everything right. How many of you know you don't deserve to be blessed? Well, I want you to start asking God all day long. God, I know I don't deserve it, but bless me. I'm expecting you to bless me. I'm waiting for you to bless me. I'm waiting for breakthrough. I'm expecting you to give me favor everywhere that I go. I'm expecting you to open doors for me. I'm expecting the best job. I'm expecting the best pay. I'm expecting the best seat in this restaurant, not because I deserve it, but because I serve a great and a mighty God. And I might add, if you're not going to ask for it, you're not going to get it. You have not because you ask not. Wrong thought pattern number nine. I want what you have. I'm jealous. You know, the Israelites, Miriam and Aaron, they were even jealous of Moses. They wanted his authority. They wanted his position. The Bible says that in Proverbs 14, 30, that envy and jealousy is like rottenness to the bones. Jealousy, envy. Got to be careful about jealousy. Last week, I detected some jealous thoughts coming into my brain. And I love having the Holy Spirit active in my life to point those things out to me so I don't just have to sit around and let the devil fill my head full of junk. And every time that the devil puts a jealous thought in my mind about somebody, I pray for them to be blessed. I'm not going to put up with it. I am not going to put up with it. Get thee behind me, Satan. I am not going to be jealous of anybody else. I will not. I will not, I will not, I will not let that roll around in my brain and take root in me. Well, you know, I think we all want to break free from wrong mindsets that keep us from having the best life that God wants us to have. And in order to do that, we're required to change our thought patterns. We have to start thinking the way God thinks. We can actually have a breakthrough through faith that something good is going to happen to us each day. Believe good things and stop believing negative, bad things. God's got a good plan for your life. Renew your mind with that thought, God has got a good plan for me. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is. 
with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now, and so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. Word je wel eens bevangen door negatieve gedachten? Kun je ze niet meer van je afschudden? Laat je gedachtenwereld geen geestelijke schroothoop worden. Joyce Meyer heeft hierover een boek geschreven. Kracht in je denken. Want onze gedachten bepalen wie wij zullen zijn. Bestel het boek Kracht in je denken. 12 power thoughts voor de strijd in je denken nu. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026... 20 22 1 0 0. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en je krijgt regelmatig exclusief een video van Joyce op jouw Facebook met korte, inspirerende boodschappen die voor nieuwe impulsen zorgen in je dagelijks leven. Dat en meer bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.